Angular Republic is a blow-by-blow -blow account of how one small Dublin bank got to be so big, too big to fail, and then how it became too rotten to save, and how the government's attempts really didn't prove enough, and how ultimately this one bank managed to bring the state to its knees and force the country into a bailout by the International Monetary Fund and the European Union. And what I've tried to do with this book is to understand exactly what happened within the bank. We know the story broadly as to what happened, but we don't really know what happened within the bank. We don't know what happened in crucial meetings and key meetings that took place uh, at the time when the bank was uh, under huge pressure, particularly in uh, key points in 2008 when the financial crisis really started to bite. Um, and what I've tried to do is speak to as many insiders as I can to try and understand exactly what happened and the pressure that the bank was under. I also look back at the uh, business model and how uh, Anglo really became a darling of the financial markets, how it was championed by stock, uh, by, the, by stock investors, by brokers, and then really how the bank, um, how its business model became corrupted, um, that it got too close to its borrowers that in the early days it made a lot of money from because it was so close to its borrowers, and how really this bank was allowed to get to the to, to a uh, level of or so systemically important that the state had to step in initially to guarantee the bank and all the other banks in September 2008 and then to nationalise Anglo in January 2009 and after that I look at what happened since then uh, since the nationalisation of the bank and how this bank has grown to uh, be such a running sore for the country and cost and has cost the state 29.3 billion currently so it's a pretty sorry tale of what happened uh, to what was Ireland's uh, third largest bank when I dug into the story itself, I found out a lot about the culture of the bank. Um, one of the aspects, one aspect of the bank uh, that really interested me was the credit committee uh, structure. And uh, Anglo had this business model where loans are approved in lightning fast time, and that was one of the bank's selling points that it, you could go in, seek a loan on a Monday, and get approval for it by the Friday. Um, and Anglo made an absolute fortune as the property boom was starting and when the property boom was in full swing because its ability to approve loans at that speed really allowed big property investors and property developers to buy land very very quickly and um, to offer the best price for it and to uh, offer really put the developers in a very strong negotiating position when it came to buying land and that's really why Anglo was such a success story when the property market was booming this was a property bank so it was going to make an absolute fortune so the bank went from being valued at about 600 million in 2000 to 13.3 billion in uh, 2007 at the peak of its powers and really it was an extraordinary growth story and people made an awful lot of money on it I mean if the average person had invested 5,000 euro in Anglo in 2000, they'd be sitting on a profit of 100,000 in 2007. And within seven years, it's an extraordinary growth rate. And um, Anglo was cheer-led by so many people in Irish society because of its success story. Um, and it made an awful lot of people an awful lot of money. It was described as the best bank in the world um, in, uh, in early 2007 uh, in terms of its performance in the stock markets. It's, uh, it's three years this month since the guarantee. It's uh, almost three years since the resignations of Sean Fitzpatrick and David Drum and uh, the nationalisation of the bank. And I felt that uh, we really don't seem to be any closer to there being prosecutions in the story of Anglo and the various investigations that are going on to the bank. And I think that uh, there's an appetite amongst the public to understand exactly what went on and why this bank is costing the state such a vast sum of money. Um, and I don't think the public are willing to wait uh, an indefinite amount of time to see if there is anyone going to be held to account for what happened at Anglo. And I felt that I had access to insiders and new voices and people who have never spoken before. And I felt that I could tell the story in a much more forensic and comprehensive way than the story had been told before. So really, Anglo Republic, I hope, achieves that purpose. It sheds a bit more light on what happened at Anglo. And pulls the curtain back on this very sorry tale.